we will now move to the virtual space and across the pond to Berkeley, where we will hear from uh, the two main researchers here, Audrey Taylor and Julie Becero from the Human Rights Center, uh, who will present findings, recommendations from this report that we've heard so much about. So I guess everyone's very excited. The virtual floor is yours. Please, you have 20 minutes or so from now. Great. I like that. Okay, for any of those who that. Uh, okay. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm Julie Cristero. I'm the director of the Health and Human Rights Program at the UCB Human Rights Center. And we're so excited to be launching this report with you today. Uh, Slide. So um, this research is uh, part of a three-phase initiative, which is a long-term partnership between the Human Rights Center to Save the Children and Nationals through child marriage provision in humanitarian setting. Um, the phase one report was completed in 2018. And this was a review of the global evidence on child marriage interventions in development and humanitarian settings. Uh, and it also included interviews with practitioners to identify their research needs. In this review, we didn't find any rigorous evaluations of interventions in humanitarian settings. And so this really is a huge gap. We have very little evidence-based child marriage programming in humanitarian settings. And so we used the research priorities of practitioners uh, identified in phase one to inform phase two. And phase two is the formative research, which we'll be talking about next. Uh, and in phase three, we'll use the findings of the formative research to uh, design an intervention that saves the children and plan international will pilot and that will evaluate in the final stage of the initiative. Next slide. So uh, again, we're very excited to uh, release the phase two report today. Oh, great. I can see the slides now. Thanks, Emily. Um, so um, this is a qualitative participatory study in refugee communities in Uganda and Jordan. And uh, we had four main research objectives. We wanted to identify and explore risk and protective factors for child marriage, decision-making, including girls' agency in the process, the role of different individuals involved, and key decision-making factors, the support needs of girls and their caregivers that contribute to vulnerability to child marriage in crisis, and then also community perspectives on solutions. Next. So we used a youth-centered participatory methodology. We really wanted to make sure that our research recommendations were grounded in girls' perspectives and experiences. So the majority of the data that we collected was from girls. Um, we conducted participatory research activities with girls ages 10 to 17, and this included cutting out flower maps, making drawings and collages, and participating in musical chair-style discussion groups to explore topics related to child marriage. And then we also interviewed older girls, ages 14 to 17, parents and caregivers of adolescent girls, and key informants in local government, UN agencies, and NGOs, uh, as well as community and religious leaders. Next slide. These are some photos from workshop activities. Um, this is a collage and flower map from Uganda. You can move to the next slide. This is just uh, some examples from Jordan to give you a sense of, of what we did. Next slide. Uh, our research sites included Bidi Bidi and Palerinia, which are primarily 
uh, South Sudanese refugee settlements in the West Nile region of Uganda, and then also urban refugee communities, primarily Syrian, in East Amman and Karak in Jordan. And for data collection, we partnered with local teams. Um, so in Jordan, we partnered with the Information and Research Center at the King Hussein Foundation, and in Uganda with um, research consultant Claire Banjavana and a team of researchers from the region. In Uganda, we collected data right before the onset of COVID-19, but in Jordan, we had to adapt our methods to implement some of these activities by phone and Zoom during the pandemic. Next slide. So this is a kind of snapshot of our study sample of girls and caregivers broken down by research site and method. We had a total sample size of 280 girls and 67 caregivers across the two countries, including both married and unmarried girls and both male and female caregivers. And we also interviewed 46 key informants. Next slide. Uh, so after analyzing the data and identifying the research findings, we held community validation workshops with girls and caregivers in each research site to share findings back with the community and also to check our interpretation of the data. And then we integrated um, their feedback into our research findings. So I'll turn it over to my colleague Audrey now to present on some of the, the findings. Hello everyone, we're so glad to be here with you today. I'm going to be sharing some of our findings uh, with you. We've really learned a lot in this study and we don't have time to go into all of it today, so I urge you to check out the report. Um, but today we thought we'd highlight six of the most important findings for addressing and responding to child marriage in humanitarian settings. Uh, the first two points address findings from our research on risk and protective factors. Uh, the first point is that addressing violence within the home is as important to addressing child marriage as a violence outside the home. It's commonly known and understood from research on child marriage in humanitarian settings that one of the most important drivers of child marriage in these contexts is violence and insecurity outside the home. And this is certainly a major risk factor that arose in our research as well. However, girls and caregivers in this study also emphasized that just as importantly, Violence and neglect within the home, often exacerbated by displacement and its related stressors, is also a leading driver of child marriage. This includes physical violence, heavy domestic workloads, quarreling between parents and girls, and abandonment through death, separation, or remarriage of a parent. Male caregivers tended to be the primary perpetrators, but female caregivers were also implicated. Girls in Uganda not living with their biological parents were said to be treated, treated particularly poorly, frequently being denied food, beaten, and overworked. In these cases, girls and caregivers said that girls saw marriage as a way to escape their difficult home lives, and mothers saw marrying their daughters as a way to protect them from their father's violence. Similarly, married girls told us that domestic violence from husbands and in-laws was one of the most significant factors impacting their health and well-being and keeping them from seeking the various supports and services that they needed. For programming to effectively address child marriage in settings of insecurity, it's critical that we not only work to address violence and insecurity outside the home, but also violence and neglect within the home by educating caregivers on positive, engaged parenting and teaching husbands of girls how to be more supportive partners. Next slide. Our second point is that peer influence is just as important in child marriage decision making and psychosocial health for displaced girls as for those at home. It's well known from research outside of humanitarian settings that peers play an important role in healthy adolescent development, but the girls and caregivers we spoke with told us that this is also true in displacement contexts and that peer influence is a major factor in child marriage decision making for girls. Peers negatively influence decision making by being poor examples and marrying early themselves, by giving poor advice, such as encouraging their friends to accept marriage proposals or arrangements, and in Uganda, encouraging behaviors that were thought to put girls at increased risk of marriage, like going to the disco or skipping school to spend time with boys. On the other hand, peers may provide positive influence by actively discouraging their friends from marrying young, 
or by being good role models, encouraging their friends to stay in school, or if they're married, sharing their negative experiences of child marriage to discourage other girls from making the same decision. Programming to address child marriage should recognize the considerable influence peers have over each other and work to counteract negative peer pressure wherever possible as well as incorporating opportunities for positive peer pressure in programming. For example, by providing peer-to-peer -peer counseling opportunities. Similarly, girls and caregivers told us that married girls often suffer from loneliness and poor mental health uh, because of the isolation they experience in their homes. This is made worse by the fact that few married girls are able to return to school following marriage and workloads at home are often excessively heavy for a young girl. Programs looking to support married girls should offer special social opportunities so they can engage with their peers in ways that support their mental, emotional, and health and well-being. Next slide. This next uh, finding highlights focuses on uh, what we learned about decision-making around child marriage in humanitarian settings. In particular, that girls often play a role in marriage decision-making. There's been significant emphasis placed on girls' lack of agency in child marriage decision-making in humanitarian settings. And it is true that many girls and caregivers whom we spoke with told us that girls have little or no say in marriage decision-making. However, in our study, just as many girls and caregivers told us the opposite, that many girls have a real say in the final decision over whom and when to marry, and that some girls even have completed autonomy. In Uganda, for example, girls and caregivers reported that it's common for girls in the camp to choose partners for themselves, which in some cases meant girls sneaking away and getting married secretly without telling their parents until later. Several explained to us that this was different from how marriages were handled in South Sudan, where parents generally made marriage decisions for their daughters. In Jordan, many girls and caregivers said that girls had the final say in deciding when and whom to marry, although they often seek support and advice from their parents before making the decision. What we learned from this report is that decision-making in these contexts falls on a continuum, where on one hand, some girls have no say, and on the other, some girls have quite a bit of say, with a range of co-decision-making in between, where girls have more or less agency, and where parents, family, and community members have different levels of involvement in the process. This was true not only between communities, but even within the same community. Next. These two quotes illustrate two ends of the spectrum um, in Uganda. First, we have an older girl from Uganda who told us, the girl is the one choosing the man and she will bring him home herself. These days, they don't choose husbands for girls. They make their own choices. And then at the other end of the continuum, we had an older girl also from Uganda tell us, some of the parents do not help us, forcing us to stay home and stop going to school. Then when we get pregnant, they forcefully send us to get married and leave their homes. For child marriage programming to be effective, it's crucial that practitioners have a clear understanding of the range of girls agents represented in their communities so that they can better target interventions to child marriage decision makers, including girls themselves, and create a more enabling environment for girls to delay marriage. Next. The remaining three slides highlight uh, findings from the research on what girls and caregivers think NGOs should do to address and respond to child marriage in their communities. Uh, this one in particular says that displaced communities still want sensitization and awareness raising uh, on child marriage. There's long been debate in the humanitarian community over how to prioritize child marriage sensitization and awareness raising activities during periods of crisis. While strong arguments can be made for addressing basic needs during acute phases of the emergency, girls and caregivers told us that sensitization and awareness raising activities on child marriage were one of the top three things practitioners could do to prevent child marriage in humanitarian contexts. Many felt that the disruption of traditional family and community structures and movement to a new cultural and legal context due to displacement presented opportunity to shift and redefine marriage and gender norms. Practically, they recommend sensitizing and raising the awareness of girls, their parents, and community members on the dangers of child marriage and early pregnancy, 
as well as the benefits of girls delaying marriage and finishing their education. They provided numerous examples of places where these activities could happen, such as community events, campaigns, lectures and meetings, and recommended integrating sensitization into trainings and activities for girls through drama, media, and peer-to-peer -peer conversations. They also felt it was critical to sensitize community and religious leaders, and then engage them in helping with sensitization work in their own communities through home-to-home -home visits or even weekly sermon. The highest priority in the acute stages of emergency is certainly ensuring that basic needs are met, but this research suggests that once the situation stabilizes, community sensitization efforts and programming to change norms around marriage may not only be feasible, uh, but are also a high community priority in settings of protracted displacement. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Julie, to take the next couple points. So uh, when we asked girls and caregivers how we can better support girls to delay marriage, they highlighted the need to address barriers to education. And I know this is widely recognized there's been strong efforts by the humanitarian community to keep girls in schools. Um, but our research highlighted that there's still a number of barriers that keep girls from attending. Uh, the most common were the financial barriers like school fees and education related expenses. In Jordan, girls expressed a need for tuition support to attend university. Um, and in Uganda, primary and secondary school fees and the most basic items like uniforms, shoes, and sanitary pads were the major barriers to girls attending school. Other barriers included long distances to schools and overcrowding of the schools and camps in Uganda. Uh, and in both contexts, resistance from caregivers or male relatives, girls' heavy domestic workloads, uh, need for uh, specialized educational programs and vocational training, particularly for married girls who often faced discrimination and stigma when trying to return to school. And then finally, protection issues or significant barriers um, in both countries. In Uganda, girls and caregivers um, talked about sexual harassment and sexual assault by male teachers in the schools as common and recommended hiring more female teachers and educating girls on how to report incidents. And in Jordan, caregivers mentioned sexual harassment in the community when girls travel to school. Um, one parent had even pulled her daughter uh, out of school for a few years for that reason. And so our research really highlighted the need to identify and address context-specific barriers to education to just make it as easy as possible for girls to stay in school. Next. In both countries, girls and caregivers said that financial assistance should be provided either by giving cash to caregivers or directly to girls as a primary strategy to prevent child marriage in their communities. For caregivers, the cash would relieve financial hardship, help them to meet their daughter's basic needs, and offset the economic incentives for them to marry their daughters early. Um, girls in Uganda said that they needed cash to cover their most basic needs, like school fees, uniforms, shoes, underwear, soap, and food, and that this was really the most common reason why girls married young. In Jordan, many girls also turned to marriage for financial support, but they said this was more so to help improve their quality of life, um, like to help with new clothing, a phone, or obtain university expenses. Uh, girls and caregivers in both countries recommended prioritizing girls for cash assistance so they could pay for things like milk, diapers, and healthcare expenses for their children. And in Uganda, many caregivers recommended making cash programming conditional on girls' school attendance, which is something that they felt like worked really well in uh, South Sudan. And although cash-based interventions have grown significantly uh, over the past decade and cash programming seems really promising to address the economic risk and decision-making factors that came through um, really clearly in our research. Um, I just wanted to highlight that there's still very little evaluation of the impact of cash programming on child marriage outcomes in humanitarian settings. So this is one of our main research recommendations in the report is to um, build this evidence base. 
Next slide. So because our field work in Jordan took place after the onset of COVID-19, we had the opportunity to revise our tools and also collect some data about the impact of COVID-19 and related restrictions on girls. So we asked about the impact on girls' health and well-being and on their access to education and services, on marriage perceptions and decision making, and on what services and support girls need most during the COVID-19 crisis. Next. So I'll focus on the impact um, of child marriage, uh, COVID-19, sorry, on marriage. Um, and we've included some quotes here to show generally how girls talked about what they were observing in their communities. Um, so one girl said, for my friends, half of them got engaged and married during the lockdown. When such things happen and girls are off school, uh, and girls realize that there's no use in studying, all of them might do the same. And another girl said, for people around me, almost 1,000 marriages happened since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. And finally, another girl said, since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, we hear of marriages happening every day. Next. So girls told us they were seeing many girls getting married or engaged during the lockdown period and that this really seemed to be increasing. Um, of course, we don't have the actual data on marriage rates uh, to be able to say that for sure, but just qualitatively, girls gave a number of reasons why they felt um, that more and more of their peers were getting married. Um, they said some girls were uh, who were engaged wanted to accelerate their marriage plans to avoid having to pay for an expensive wedding later. Uh, other girls wanted to leave home either because of the increased restrictions on their mobility during the pandemic uh, or because they had to bear more of the burden of increased housework while with their families all day. They also said some girls were jealous of their sisters or peers who were married and treated well by their husbands during lockdown, and that made them want to be married too. Uh, the increased financial strain on families caused some parents to pressure their daughters to get married to reduce household expenses and receive a dowry. And finally, schools were closed, and uh, even though classes were made available over TV channels or through online formats, Many girls uh, faced greater barriers to education, including difficulty learning without um, more interaction with their teachers, not having enough mobile phones for all the children and children, not having a strong internet signal or internet credit to join online classes, or just not knowing how to access online programs. Um, so for these reasons, some girls felt like now marriage was really their, their best option. Next slide. Mm. So we asked girls what services and support they need most during the COVID-19 crisis, and we had a lot of findings uh, in this area. So I'll just highlight the two most common responses. Um, they wanted increased counseling and psychosocial support to cope with additional stress, anxiety, and depression um, that they were experiencing. They wanted um, both individual counseling and also just ways to engage in more social activities with their peers um, by phone or through online formats. Um, they also wanted educational support services to help them with distance learning and the items like tablets, mobile phones, and SIM cards with internet credit uh, to make sure that they can access online education. So in our report, we have a special section with um, findings and recommendations for programming during COVID-19. Next slide. We'd like to thank our donors for making this research possible. The study was commissioned by Save the Children and Plan International, and significant co-funding was provided by Danita and Gage. So thank you. We have Nina Gora on the line as well, who is head of gender equality as it pertains to the humanitarian affair for Save the Children. Uh, in a few minutes for Nina to say something on how this research, this work, this knowledge can be taken forward. 
So Nina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me just put my video on. Hopefully you can all see me. Yes. Excellent. Thanks for the thoughts up, Emily. Brilliant. Hi, everyone. I'm glad you all get to be in the same room together. I'm quite jealous. I'm with you. Um, but thank you to everyone who's organised this event. And thank you to everyone who funded this research and the attention that the research is going to, uh, to generate on child marriage prevention response. There's a little bit of an echo, so I don't know if it's anywhere eliminating that. Um, so I will very briefly speak about phase three, which builds on the successful completion of phases one and two. Um, as you'll see, hopefully from the slide you're looking at, phase three is the final step towards providing the sector with an evidence-based model for child marriage prevention and response in humanitarian settings. So this is obviously something we're all tremendously invested in and excited about. Um, it will involve the piloting of the findings and the solutions which were generated through phase two by the communities themselves, in particular by adolescent girls. Um, because like Bev was saying, when we set up solutions labs and facilitated girls to generate their own solutions and their own ideas, that is where a lot of change, meaningful, sustainable, lasting change will come from. So our intention, intention sorry, in this pilot is to look at one humanitarian context and to evaluate the impact of the pilot. To begin with, we will develop a theory of change for the pilot, which will be based on the findings and the solutions from this report, as well as, of course, bringing women's rights organisations and girl-led initiatives around the table so that we are drawing continuously on the voices of women and girls and those voices will inform the pilot throughout. Um, and also we wanted to welcome, and I particularly wanted to welcome the increased focus throughout the sector on women's rights organisations, women-led organisations and girl-led initiatives, because again, we see that as a big driver of sustainable change. Then following the pilot, um, the evaluation will use a rigorous um, quasi-experimental design with a comparison community to be able to determine whether the intervention is having an impact on the outcomes related to child marriage knowledge, attitudes and practices among girls and caregivers and outcomes related to participation in education, voice and decision making and of course reproductive health for married and unmarried girls over time. Following the pilot and the evaluation, our ambition as Save the Children as plan, as a human rights centre, is really to scale and therefore to support married girls and girls at risk of marriage with access to a holistic, multi-sectoral and evidence-based model across multiple contexts and eventually all humanitarian contexts. If we are able to collectively secure the necessary funding for phase, phase three, it would be with this view to scaling across all contexts where we work. And our organisations are very well positioned to scale because we have um, presence in so many contexts and because we work across so many sectors. And as we've heard from Julian Audrey, a proper response requires multi-sectoral work. Proper prevention requires multi-sectoral work. But we cannot achieve this vision of an evidence-based model for child marriage prevention and response in humanitarian settings without a collective coming together of researchers, practitioners, donors, and of course, local women's rights organizations and girl-led initiatives. And we very much hope that you will join us. Thank you very much.